Next up for bid on the Price is Right <laughs> is this old Murray Garden Tiller. It's got a four cycle, probably five horsepower Briggs and Stratton on it. And Robber and I got it for free from the man who sold us Rusty. He just threw it in because I asked him to. I saw it sitting there and I looked like he hadn't touched it in a long time. I said, what are you going to do with that thing? He says, I don't know. I said, throw it in for the price. We already got an incredible deal on the truck as it was. But uh, he threw it in. Nice guy that he is. And uh, I don't know. We bought a couple of replacement belts for it. And we bought a replacement carburetor for it. Uh, I don't know. All told about $75 worth of parts. And then we also, uh, you know, bought a new plug and a tune-up kit for it. So, next thing to do is going to be to get that carburetor off, get the new one installed, and get this thing running. I could get it to turn over with a little bit of starting fluid, but can't keep it running. And I think it's because the carburetor is just gelled up. I don't know. But uh, I thought rather than mess with it and vat the carburetor and do all that kind of stuff, it's probably just cheaper and easier to pull it off and replace it. So that's what we're doing next. I love finding old stuff that's well made and is still in relatively good condition except for TLC, you know, or needing a little bit of repair and getting it running and making it work again. It's so much more satisfying than buying a new thing. The other nice thing about it is that you actually get to know the machine by working on it. And of course there are people out there who say, I don't want to know it. I don't want to, <laughs> excuse me. I don't want to have to mess with that stuff. That's fine. Uh, but I love it. You know, we've made some pretty good purchases that way. Like Rusty. Rusty was an excellent purchase. We got a good deal on Rusty. We had to put some money into Rusty. And that means that, you know, with the money we put into it, it's probably about equal to its resale value now. Now we know what we've got uh, in Rusty. And uh, the same thing goes for Dyna. Dyna may not have been such a a great purchase for us. We might have spent a little bit more than we intended to on Dyna, and she's still not done. Um, and so, you know, we went and got that other Dyna hoe for parts, uh, and turns out that the other Dyna hoe is actually in better shape than Dyna. So, I mean, in that regard, yeah, we may not have made the best purchase because, uh, you know, of course, the, uh, that other Dyna hoe wasn't available when we were looking. But at least we know what we have with Dyna, especially things that I can work on, you know, that I can do. This new stuff, they've made it too complicated and too difficult for an owner to do work on them. Uh, you have to have specialized tools and equipment, <clears throat> you know, all this stuff. And while it is harder to find <clears throat> parts for aging equipment, if you invest in equipment that a lot of which were made, then, you know, there is a market out there for used parts and remanufacture and, and retrofit, what they call will fit or aftermarket parts. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's like a, like with Dyna, it was like an Easter egg hunt, you know, trying to find some of the parts we needed, but they're out there. And uh, with a little bit of searching, we found them, got them, glad we did. Yeah, see, even on the older equipment, some of the older equipment was made with bolts and stuff that are hard to get to, but not nearly as bad as the stuff today, I mean. Or like on Rusty, I mean Rusty's 26 year old truck and on Rusty <laughs> in order to replace the PCV valve, you know a fairly routine kind of maintenance thing 
you've got to practically pull the whole top of the engine off just to get to it and then it takes all of about 15 seconds to pull the old valve out and pop the new one in because there's no bolt or anything it just sits there it just pops in with a rubber uh, washer on it to hold it in place and pops right out but yeah you have to pull off the entire top of the engine just to get to it so this was free a new tiller would have cost it like this this size probably would have cost five hundred dollars a used one three hundred and we're going to be able to get this running for $75 in parts uh, and about, I don't know, hour, hour and a half of our time. Love to know what everybody's plans are for this summer. Just put down in the comments, you know, what you're planning to do this summer on your homestead. It looks like on our homestead we're planning to, you know, repair a lot of wind damage. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys have going and you know have you made plans for your homestead I mean what steps have you taken how far along are you we'd love to hear that I mean the whole reason we got involved in YouTube was to be part of a community we're really more interested in getting to know people and being part of a community of people who who want to do this kind of thing and so uh, yeah, please tell us well, what's, what's going on with you guys. Um, so many of you who watch our channel uh, don't do homesteading. You do other things, and that's just fine. But hey, we'd like still like to hear. I'm almost there. Well, I got the fuel tank cleaned up and put a fresh coat of paint on it. In this climate, it won't take too long for that to dry. So while I'm waiting, uh, let's talk about the carburetor a little bit. Here's the new carburetor. And it uh, uh, sits in the tank just like the old one. Carburetors are interesting things. <laughs> a lot of people don't like them because they think that they're old technology and that they're, you know, that they don't work as well. They, they give more trouble and have, you know, more inherent issues. Uh, than say new fuel injection uh, and fuel injected engines but I don't know carburetors don't intimidate me all they do is take gas mix it with air and create a vapor you know which goes into the engine and burns it's got a choke new vehicles don't have a choke or if they do it's an automatic choke but this one's got a manual choke that you pull out when you want to you know start it uh, fuel needs a certain temperature in order to vaporize properly so that it'll burn if the air is too cold and then the ratio of gas to air uh, is off and you need less air and more fuel for it to vaporize properly so that it can fire um, inside the engine and so what a choke does is it cuts off the air as you can see there's a cylinder in there when i push it it opens it up and allows uh, air inside and then when I pull it pull out the choke it closes it chokes off the air and allows pure fuel to get in there and then once it gets running and is warmed up you can gradually or even totally open that choke back up and introduce air once things are warmed up uh, it pumps the gas up from the tank through this tube um, by way of a diaphragm behind here now a diaphragm is nothing more than a little you know, round piece of rubber that is on a spring that goes back and forth and it uses the vacuum from the engine to pull the gas in and pump it uh, sort of thing. So that's what it does. I don't know. I like carburetors. I think they're cool. But uh, it's, a, it's a neat invention with a name like carburetor. I imagine some French guy invented it. But uh, I don't know. It's just kind of cool. That's a carburetor. As I told you, I already got the belts. He told me that I was going to need a rear pulley, but okay. So in looking at this, when I turn these pulleys this way, it wants to roll the tines forward. So I know that this direction is forward. What direction does the engine turn is the next question. Let's disconnect the spark plug so we don't get sparked. Just pull the puller on this to see, okay. So the engine wants to turn forward in the same direction as the tines to go forward. That means that this would be the forward 
working pulley. This would be the backward working pulley. And on this side, we have two wires. See, so you've got two levers up here, one underneath the handle and one above the handle. This one above the handle, I guess, is supposed to engage the belt to make it go forward because there's an F marked on it. The one underneath engages this one, which engages the belt for backward. So I'm missing a pulley. I'm missing this pulley right here. It looks like I have the reverse pulley, but I don't have the forward pulley. And that's what I need to order. I've got to clean up this shaft. Then I've got to measure it, figure out the width of this little keyway. And then I need to order a pulley and a key for it so that I can put this on and get this thing running. Okay, so the number on the tiller itself, the model number of the Murray brand tiller, I've got is some of it scratched off. So I, I think I, using the few numbers that I have, I think I've located the tiller that we should be looking at here. And I see the same motor, same configuration. You've got a main drive shaft, and then you've got what's called a jack shaft. Um, and we have this pulley, but we don't have this pulley. You obviously can't get these replacement parts through Murray anymore. I checked several other uh sources you know for like tiller parts and mower parts aftermarket couldn't find anything so i went to a pulley on jack small engines he sells pulleys and he's got these pulleys that have a three quarter inch bore a three quarter inch bore and a three sixteenths uh keyway with a five sixteenths 18 set screw which looks like that's what was on, what was on the other one he does have he doesn't have, he's got a two inch diameter one and he's got a three and a half inch diameter one. So I went out there and measured in it a three and a half inch diameter one would just fit. Looking at the uh, schematic again, it looks like that would be a three and a half inch half inch belts. So let me go check the belt on this and see if I got a half inch belt. I've got the belts on here in the configuration they're supposed to be. Um, of course, the only thing I'm missing is that pulley. And I just want to test this idea of a three and a half inch pulley fitting in here. Half a three and a half would be one and three quarter. If I pull the belt out, got this at uh, one and three quarter, then that puts three right about here. That means that this belt should fit inside the groove of the pulley. This idler creates the tension on the pulley so when I hit the forward lever that idler pulls it up pulls it against the pulley engages it and gets it going and then when I want to go in reverse I pull on this one it tightens that belt and engages reverse so yeah I think the three and a half inch pulley will do fine so I'll go ahead and order it see how quickly I can get it here it looks like whoever had this before would use this little wire here that was wired inside there to the magneto and then when they wanted to kill the engine they would just touch it to the engine block like that and it would send the spark to ground and kill the engine well <clears throat> i mean if you need to shut this thing off quickly for whatever reason that's not the greatest idea so i think i'll just while i'm at it while i'm ordering stuff i'll go ahead and get a new kill switch for this most of them come with a push button that'll mount to the bar and then just plug right into the magneto. Okay, so <laughs> the plot thickens. You know, I was looking at this, uh, there's a little space, there should be a little spade connector here on the inside of this magneto. This is the coil or magneto, um, where you could hook up the kill switch. And then I noticed this little wire sitting here that had been cut off. And I thought, well, that's odd because this wire goes down to points which would be down here in this motor. And so if it's clipped, this thing shouldn't run, but I have had it running. So I'm wondering if this coil has been changed out at some time in the past, and if this is a, an electronic ignition. So yes, we have an electronic ignition. Some point in the past, somebody replaced this with an electronic coil. <clears throat> the thing I did notice though, is that the point gap is off. The, you'll notice the coil, there's supposed to be a gap right here between the flywheel 
and this uh, point, uh, this coil terminal, and uh, <laughs> it's actually brushing up against you. You can hear it. So we've got to, uh, you know, maybe run a little uh, Scotch Brite pad over this, and then uh, reset this. This gap should be set to between 10 and 12 thousandths. Okay, so I've heard that a business card is about 10 thousandths of an inch. And so let me run the coil right over the magnet. These aluminum fins right here on this flywheel hold the magnet. Um, anytime a magnet is drawn across a wire, it produces an electric current. That's how generators and electric motors and stuff work. So every time this spins, it creates a magnetic, you know, pulse that runs through this coil, is amplified, and then runs to the spark plug and uh, keeps the engine going. So anyway, uh, that's today's lesson on an internal combustion engine. Let's tighten this down. I don't think you want to you want to tighten these bolts here too tight. You just want them snug. Pull the card out. Come on out. It's not really scraping it anymore, but I think I'm hearing the old points in there. Um, I don't know why they didn't remove the old points when they put in this electronic ignition. Would have been the way to go. I really don't feel like tearing this down to get in there and do it. Um, at least it's not scraping the flywheel anymore like it was. And remember, when you spin the engine, make sure that the spark plug is disconnected. Uh, you guys, um, Robert's not here, so please don't tell her I'm working on her favorite table. It's just easier to do this sitting down indoors than it is sitting outside in the sand. So, new carburetor. There should be no need to change any of the settings on this carburetor. It should be automatically set. But uh, let's get this gasket on. Yeah. Okay. Don't tighten them all up. You got them all set. Okay, I'm an idiot. <laughs> you know, I was putting putting this carbon tank back on and I just I just noticed this right here. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. But what it is is a kill switch. It's an old-fashioned kind of kill switch that grounds out the spark plug. Uh, instead of grounding out this wire to the frame or instead of grounding out this wire to the frame, it just kills the spark plug. So, I mean, all you need to do is just reach down and go like that and it shuts it off. But I don't know. You guys think I should get a kill switch for it anyway? Eh, let me know what you think in the comments. All right, carbs on, tanks in. Uh... I've got the gap cured on the uh, coil, and there are no belts on, so I don't have to worry about the tines turning. Let's uh, let's see what we can do with this thing. Throttles all the way. Yeah, throttles off or low. Okay, well that thing is really blowing oil. That's oil that's coming out of carburetor. It's really burning it. I wonder what's going on. The first couple of minutes, I guess I expected that. Uh, it's also wavering on its idle and stuff. I wonder if that's a connection issue with the either the coil or 
the uh, spark plug or something. Oh, we got more stuff to do on it anyway. We'll check it out later.